Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast brought to you by the Houston Law Review about legal issues, prominent lawyers, and the study and practice of law. I'm Harrison Little. And I'm Jake Garino, and we are your hosts for Season 5. Thank you for joining us. outstanding institution. I'm, I'm now the longest serving law school dean in the state of Texas. I am the law school's I'm the first law, the law school's first dean of black, uh, black dean. Um, and when I came from New York, I think people probably said that why they hire that black dean from that black faculty member from New York and he's going to stay in Houston and he's going to build this $93 million state-of-the-art building that is the envy of so many of our peers in the state of Texas as well as nationwide. I want you to know that a number of our dean, my dean colleagues in Texas have come and viewed the building as a model for them, for them to have in their own building. Some have done it with, by invitation and a request and some have done it somewhat surreptitiously, um, all gaining insights and actually using UH Law Center's John M. O'Quinn building as a model for the law school building of the future. A um, couple of things, you know, we, are, we have several top 10 programs. Our part-time program is ranked number six in the nation. Our intellectual property program is number, ranked also number six in the nation. And our health law road program is ranked rank number nine. And then we have 50 programs that are ranked in the top, uh, we have eight programs, I'm sorry, 10 programs ranked in the top 50, in, and several ranked in the top 30, including our environmental law program and our legal writing program. Uh, we have been named diversity champion by Insight Diversity Magazine. We've won their Higher Education Excellence Diversity Award for eight years in a row. And we've been able to combine excellence and diversity at the same time. Our entering class is about 44% students from underrepresented backgrounds, 53% women, 15% uh, LGBTQ+, about 20% first generation, while at the same time having the highest median GPA of 3.72 and the highest median LSAT of 161 in the law school's history. So you can have excellence and diversity at the same time. Um, so the other thing that Professor Moran also said, I should talk about the art, is what she suggested last night at dinner. So the building is really a testament to our alumni and our community. And without the efforts of our alumni to provide support for the building to make the funds available, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so let's give them a round of applause generally. <laughs> And you'll see, uh, we actually have the most namings of any other building on campus. And we have namings of people from every, almost every ge geographical region where alumni are, and every racial, ethnic, and gender group. So that's really the key of the success of the fundraising is to go beyond the borders and, of Houston and get beyond the borders of the folks that we normally go to for fundraising. Um, but the art, as I'm going back to that, is also beautiful. So every, um, we wanted a building that was beautiful and modern and looked to the future, not the past. Sort of what we expect legal education, the law to do is to look to the future, not the past. And the building, we wanted to make sure the building was, you know, beautiful and memorable and modern. And the art, as part of every project at UH, a certain percentage of the funding goes to UH Public Art. And so you'll see a number of gorgeous, for those who are here, for those online, you may not be able to see this, but I would encourage you to come visit our building. Um, and for those who are here, I'm sure many of you have seen it. And for those who are guests, please take a, a tour before you leave. But we have a number of really gorgeous artworks specifically commissioned for the building. So one on the first floor is from a MacArthur genius, Professor Rick Lowe, who's a professor 
at the McGovern, UH McGovern School of the Arts. It is called The Line. It depicts the uh, wards in Houston. It's quite beautiful, it's very colorful, but it has a special meaning. And there's art by a lot of other artists of all different backgrounds throughout the building that are very, very modern and are thought provoking from the standpoint of how art reflects law. So that's my welcome. I really thank you all for being here. I look forward to the conversation on this perennial eclipse. Uh, and I now turn to my colleague, uh, Professor Morales, who will do the introductions of our panelists. So thank you, Professor Morales. Thank you, Dean. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, Today I have the uh, incredible privilege and honor of introducing Rachel F. Moran, who's visiting us today to present the 28th Annual Frankel Lecture. Um, and as we've heard, right, her paper is entitled The Perennial Eclipse, Race, Immigration, and How Latinx Count in American Politics. So uh, Professor Moran is a Latina trailblazer and a living legend. Um, she is breaking new ground, I think, for her is, you know, in her DNA. Um, her impact on the legal academy, uh, in her scholarship, teaching, administrative leadership, and service to the academic profession um, have simply been profound. Um, I'm going to go ahead and summarize all of her achievements, but the headline takeaway for y'all is that Professor Moran has accomplished in one career um, what um, most law professors, it would, it would take four or five careers to accomplish. And she's still going. Um, so let's start with titles held. Um, professor Moran is currently professor of law at Texas A&M University School of Law. Before that, she was distinguished and chancellor's professor of law at UC Irvine and a founding member of that faculty. Um, before that, she was the Michael J. Connell Distinguished Professor of Law and Dean Emerita at UCLA. And there's more. Before that, um, she was the Robert D. and Leslie K. Raven Professor of Law at UC Berkeley. Um, I know, it's amazing. Um, so Moran has written over 100 articles, book chapters, and short commentaries. Her work has been cited over 3,000 times. Um, her scholarship has ranged across topics such as bilingual education, desegregation, and affirmative action, um, and now election law. Um, but her work appears unified, at least to me, by a commitment to anti-subordination principles and a conviction, I think, to weave Latino people um, into the warp and weft of the American social fabric. Um, Beyond the stacks of articles, there's also books, if you can believe it. Um, Professor Moran is co-author of Education Policy and the Law, one of the most widely adopted casebooks in the field. She co-edited with uh, Devin Garbato, a leading anthology on race and law stories. She published a path-breaking monograph um, on interracial intimacy, the regulation of race and romance. Um, her service to the profession also goes um, just above and beyond the simple task of running UCLA Law School. Um, she was the inaugural Newcomb Fellows Research Chair in Diversity in Law at the American Bar Foundation, where she collaborated with Director Emeritus um, uh, Robert L. Nelson to launch an initiative called The Future of Latinos in the United States, Law, Opportunity, and Mobility. Um, the project has commissioned white papers and hosted roundtables across the country. Moran is a member of the American Law Institute, obviously, and the American Bar Foundation. She is a Hagler Fellow at Texas A&M University in addition to her appointment, a Fellow of the UCLA Civil Rights Project, a member of the Board of Trustees for the Law and Society Association, and past president of the Association of American Law Schools. Um, in 2011, and this is sort of the coup de grace, um, President Obama appointed her to the permanent committee for the Oliver Wendell Holmes devise. I have to admit, I didn't look up and I don't know what that committee is or does, but it involves an appointment by President Obama, so <laughs> I am duly impressed. Um, so with that, um, I'll give uh, Rachel, well, no, I'm sorry, and let me introduce our other speakers and then I'll give Rachel the stage. Sorry, guys. Um, 
Joseph Fishkin. Um, so we have two wonderful respondents today who will be responding to the ideas um, in uh, Professor Moran's talk. Um, the uh, Joseph Fishkin is a professor of law at UCLA Law School, where he teaches and writes about employment discrimination law, election law, constitutional law, and education law, fair housing law, poverty, and you do a lot, um, and distributive justice. Before joining UCLA, he was a Texan. Um, he taught for a decade at the University of Texas School of Law, where he was the Mars McLean Professor in Law. He was also a visiting professor at Yale Law School. Fishkin received his BA in Ethics, Politics, and Economics, summa cum laude at Yale, his JD at Yale Law School, and his DPhil in Politics at Oxford, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. After law school, uh, Professor Fishkin clerked for Chief Judge uh, Chief Justice, excuse me, Margaret H. Marshall of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts. Um, before starting law teaching, he was a Rubenhausen Fellow at Yale. Um, Fishkin's latest enormous doorstopper um, book, the, and it's, it's, it's stopping my door, and I need to read it, but I haven't yet, because it's so big. Um, but it's very well reviewed, so y'all read it before I do. Um, it's called The Anti-Oligarchy Constitution, Reconstructing the Economic Foundations of American Democracy with Willie Forbath. Um, and that was recently published by Harvard University Press. His first book was called Bottlenecks, A New Theory of Equal Opportunity. And that book won the North American Society for Social Philosophy Book Award um, and was published by Oxford University Press. Um, his writings also appeared in various publications, including Columbia Law Review, the Supreme Court Review, the Yale Law Journal, and Nomos. He writes public blog posts at Balkanization. Last, but very much not least, we have Ilya Soman. Ilya Soman is a professor of law at George Mason University and the B. Kenneth Simon Chair in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. His research focuses on constitutional law, property law, a demo democratic theory, federalism, and migration rights. He is the author of Free to Move, Foot Voting, Migration and Political Freedom, uh, also, Democracy and Political Ignorance, Why Smaller Government is Smarter. These are all books, by the way. Um, the Grasping Hand, <laughs> Kilo, uh, The City of New London and the Limits of Enforcement. And he is the co-author of the book, A Conspiracy Against Obamacare, The Volk Conspiracy, and The Healthcare Case. He co-edited Eminent Domain, A Comparative Perspective, um, and democracy and political ignorance uh, has also been translated into multiple languages, including Italian and Japanese. Professor Soman's work has appeared in all the top law journals, including the Yale Law Journal, Stanford Law Review, Northwestern University Law Review, Georgetown Critical Review, and others. Professor Soman is very well known for his public-facing scholarship, uh, or I guess public scholar work, um, he has written op-eds and other articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and Los Angeles Times. Um, Professor Soman clerked for Judge Jerry E. Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals, um, earned his B.A. summa cum laude at Amherst, um, and M.A. in political science at Harvard, and his J.D. from Yale. With Without further ado, um, we'll get this impressive discussion underway. Um, and if uh, Professor Moran would please step up. Well, I wanted to thank Dean Baines for that warm welcome and Professor Morales for that generous introduction. I also wanted to thank my commentators, Professor Fishkin and Professor Selman. As you can tell, they're very busy and they took time out of their schedules to read and really engage with my work and I'm very grateful to them. I also want to express my appreciation of the Frankel family's commitment. This is 28 years of lively discourse and I think now more than ever, we need to talk about difficult things in a constructive way and try to break through the polarization that often paralyzes our ability to move forward. So I re really appreciate the remarkable opportunity that this lecture presents to talk about what I think are some very challenging and important issues related to our representative democracy. And to do that, I have been thinking about the case I'm gonna be discussing today since it came down, and I felt that it didn't get the attention it deserved. 
but I thought this is the right moment, this is the right opportunity for me to really talk about that case and dig in, and Texas is precisely the place to do it. So I want to begin my lecture by explaining to you why I think Texas is so pivotal in American politics today. I want to talk to you about the case Evanwell versus Abbott, handed down in 2016, which addresses who should count when we're apportioning political representation. Then I want to give you a little preview of my commentators' work, their political theory, and their notion that we shouldn't be tremendously worried because there are other forms of representation besides formal political representation that help us to get the right results. I then want to turn to a very different viewpoint, that of people who worry about immigrants and their full integration into American life. And then I want to close with some legal, which seems appropriate here at the University of Houston Law Center, analysis of whether or not shifting to a different way of counting might ever violate the Voting Rights Act. So that is what I'm going to be talking about today. So let's start with Texas and why Texas matters so much. I want to give you this quote from Mick Mulvaney because he really said it, and he said it back in 2015, that there are three million Hispanic people in Texas and they're going to be able to register to vote. And if we can't pull in more of that vote than Mitt Romney did, and Mitt Romney performed very poorly with Hispanic voters, we will never elect another Republican president again, right? So for the Republican Party, Texas is the future of its national prominence. Without Texas, you can't win the presidency. And given the change in the demographics of Texas, we may not be able to win Texas. Well, and I don't think it was coincidental, this led to a lot of concern about how to retain Republican dominance in the state. And at the same time that Mick Mulvaney was predicting the possibility of doom for the Republican Party and its presidential aspirations, at the same time, the court was deliberating about a case that looked at how we count the population. Now, I'm sure you, many of you here have taken constitutional law. I don't know if you're all lawyers or law students and have all taken constitutional law. Do we have a raise of hands? How many? I can't see the online folks, but yes, pretty clearly. And you might have thought, well, hasn't this already been decided? It's one person, one vote. It's total population. Isn't that the answer? And it turned out that wasn't the answer. It's true that total population is mandatory for apportioning representation for the House in the United States Congress, but it isn't mandated for state apportionment. And so in the, the person here, Sue Evanwell, very active in the Republican Party here in the state of Texas, brought suit. And she alleged that by using total population to apportion representation in the state house here in Texas, she was being denied equal protection because her vote didn't count in the way that other people's votes counted. And she emphasized how different the districts here in Texas were in terms of how much of the population was not eligible to vote. And she said in her district, it was a rural district, that, that if you looked at who was uh, a registered, uh, not registered, but eligible to vote, there were many more in her district than other districts. Now, why were there those disparities? Primarily because of differences in the youthful population, people who were minors and couldn't vote, and people who were non-citizens and couldn't vote. But her claim was, I have to fight harder for my vote to count because I have to compete with more citizen voting age people. Now, the United States Supreme Court made pretty quick work of this. The decision was unanimous. Um, and what they said was, Texas can use total population, but it does have the discretion to choose other ways of counting to apportion representation in the state house. Now, the opinion was very careful to skirt the idea of what kinds of representation are required under the Constitution. Sue Evanwell said it was voter equality. Every voter must have the same weight within their district. But others had said it's really representative equality for everybody who lives in the district. 
And by skirting that issue and leaving it for another day, she got unanimity in the decision because it really didn't decide some important issues. It kind of kicked the can down the road. Now, there were amicus briefs filed, and they were filed by the Texas Senate Hispanic Caucus, the Texas House of Representatives Caucus, and the, these briefs really emphasize that representational equality, the idea that we need equal access to representation for everyone who lives in a district, whether or not they're eligible to vote. And it's interesting because they pointed out that on the new maps that Sue Evanwell proposed, that every one of the 10 most underpopulated districts, which would have to be redone, they were mostly in large urban areas like Houston, El Paso, and Dallas. And that eight of 10 members of the Hispanic Caucus would have been in underpopulated districts and so would presumably have had their seats in play. Now, what happened after Evanwell is not that everybody gave up because the case said you have the discretion as a state to use alternative methods if you want to. And so there was ongoing interest and Missouri, just a few years ago, passed a constitutional amendment that would allow, if they desired to do so, the use of citizen voting age population instead of total population. Nebraska passed that kind of legislation in 2018 and Maine's constitution also has a provision for county commissions. Um, now, the federal government also showed an ongoing interest. And so during Evanwell, one of the big problems with using citizen voting age population is that the census does not ask about citizenship. So you don't have reliable data at a national level on who's a citizen and who isn't in a particular area. And so to address that, Secretary Wilbur Ross under the Trump administration tried to add a citizenship question to the census. Now that was unsuccessful, not because you can't add such a question, but because the United States Supreme Court in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts concluded that Secretary Ross's reasons were pretextual, that he hadn't really listened to experts and the dangers of undercount, and that it really wasn't plausible that this was done to protect minorities under the Voting Rights Act. And so, they said, if you want to add a citizenship question, you need to go back and do it the right way. Um, but it was too late then because the census had to be set. Um, now, after the court's decision, Ross didn't give up. So he issued a memorandum in which he would have excluded undocumented immigrants from the count when apportioning the House, which is supposed to be based on total population, and also when allocating votes in the all-critical electoral college. And then when Biden was elected, he immediately rescinded the memorandum. Now, what's also interesting after Evanwell is that during this litigation over adding a census question, there were new revelations that came to light about the backstory of the Evanwell case. Now, originally when Evanwell was filed, the media portrayed it as a case about rural urban power, uh, about partisan politics, but there was very little discussion initially about its impact on minority representation in Texas. And what came out during the litigation was there was someone by the name of Thomas Hofeller who was known as the Republican Michelangelo of gerrymandering, that was really how they, how they described him, and his daughter produced a memorandum showing that he had been hired to look at the impact of shifting from total population to citizen voting age population in Texas. And what he found was, yes, there were partisan implications. It would help Republicans. But there were also implications because it would harm Latinx voters in the state and reduce their influence. And that research was actually critical in deciding whether Sue Evanwell should file the lawsuit. Now, why Evanwell matters? Well, I think Evanwell matters and it really hasn't received the attention it deserves because it illustrates a really important question that has arisen because of the demographic transformation of our population. When Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act was passed, the nation was almost entirely black and white. The proportion of Latinx and Asian Americans was like about 5%. And when you look at the black-white population, 
blacks were overwhelmingly citizens. And the actually whites had a little lower levels of citizenship, but they were still very, very high. So there really wasn't any reason to think that differential rates of citizenship based on race would pose any dangers to equitable voting opportunities. But that picture has really changed. As you can see from this brief that was filed by the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and other public interest organizations, because there are tremendous gaps. First of all, for non-Hispanic whites, the rates of citizenship eligible voting age are 79.1. So those are people eligible in terms of age and citizenship status. There is a gap now for blacks which reflects the rise in black immigration. So you really see many more black immigrants today. And that's so 70.2, that's a gap. But the really dramatic gap is when you look at Asians and Latinx, two very fast growing populations and now Latinx outnumber blacks as the single largest minority groups. And you see that it's just 54.5% of Asians who are eligible to vote and 45.2% of Latinx. So under half of all Latinx in the country are eligible. And yet when you see claims that Latinx haven't really achieved the level of political influence they should have, it's always portrayed as a lack of will or motivation or interest, and not that there are simply many of them who are not eligible to vote. Now, I want to say that I find that a very important and alarming set of statistics, but we have two commentators who tried to restore my confidence that it'll all be fine, right? Because there are other ways that people have input into the political process that will protect our interests in fair representation. And I want to begin with Professor Fishkin, who wrote at the time about Evanwell, one of the few who wrote about it not in terms of the problems of getting data, but in terms of the theories of representation. And he highlighted the ways that Evan Wells shows that we very often rely on virtual representation. There will always be people who cannot vote, and they have to rely on those who can vote to protect their interests. And so the issue is not whether virtual representation happens, but whether it's good virtual representation. And he argued that because of segregation, we actually have a sort of geographic solution that these compact, contiguous communities of interest protect the quality of virtual representation. And, and he describes that as the dead simple geographic pin drop approach, which is an unintentionally elegant solution. So he says, yes, it's true there's virtual representation, but we can rest assured that at least we have some guarantor of the quality through this geographic patterns. Now, Professor Soman also says, don't worry so much, right? But he rests on very different grounds. And so what he does is to say, you know what? The formal electoral process isn't that effective in general because your likelihood of influencing the outcome is minuscule, right? So really, people don't invest that much in the process. They don't get that informed. They don't really deliberate a lot about it. But what they do invest in are decisions about whether to move, which he calls foot voting. And so you might say, I'm very unhappy where I am. I'm going to move somewhere with more congenial employment, parks, policies. And that's where people really, really invest. And disenfranchised people can move as well. So they don't have to rely entirely on the formal political process. Now, I want to just touch on what I see. I think there are many virtues to these arguments. I enjoyed reading these arguments. I do think there are some limits that I want to highlight. Um, and I know they're going to elaborate more on their theories in a moment. But I wanted to call your attention to a book by Abigail Leslie Andrews, who writes about, in an ethnographic way, two communities in Southern California. Now, both of these communities came about through undocumented immigration from the state of Oaxaca. These were remote villages. One was called Retorno, the other was Partida. And the folks from Retorno settled in uh, northern San Diego and the ones from Partida in Los Angeles. And they had very different experiences because northern San Diego had very vigorous enforcement of immigration policies and Los Angeles 
due to labor organizing and social movements had a very different approach of, of rather tepid enforcement and efforts to integrate these immigrants rather than try to deport them. Um, now, one of the things that you can see here is that these are both communities in a very small geographic area and they have very different policies and the people in the local communities differ greatly in their views about immigration. And so the quality of virtual representation is very different in the two places. And I think that's one thing we have to wonder about. How well does virtual representation work, not just in sort of the really high level view, but in particular communities? Another is that I went into the literature, and it's interesting because they have interviewed Latinx voters who often will say, I feel an obligation to represent those who can't vote. But that means they have to trade off their own interests in order to advance those of disenfranchised people with whom they identify, but may not share the entirely identical political portfolio or wish list. And so there are trade-offs they have to make that those who don't feel an obligation to represent the disenfranchised don't have to worry about. They don't have to bear that extra burden. And so if there are big disparities in levels of virtual representation that are required, it means that some constituencies have to trade off more than others in order to achieve the goals of virtual representation. And the final thing that I want to say is if geography is our guarantor, it does create perverse incentives to segregate. And I don't know if any of you have read Charles Blow's book on The Devil We Know, or The Devil You Know. It, it's all about why African Americans should move to the South to concentrate their political power and exercise greater influence. And it really runs against the grain of our general desire to see more integration. Now, with respect to foot voting, Professor Solman does talk about how harsh immigration policies actually interrupt the ability to vote with one's feet. And so he acknowledges that there are barriers to movement. He also talks about the spillover effects on non-immigrants, and he emphasizes employers not being able to hire the people they want to, people not being able to work where they want to. I will say there's another form of spillover effect, which is the impact of racial profiling on people who are not immigrants, but who nonetheless get identified as suspect and get stopped, and we saw an example of that here in Texas in just a moment. Governor Abbott actually created Operation Lone Star. I'm, I'm imagining you're all familiar with that, to crack down on immigration, and initially the people of Eagle Pass, Texas were very enthusiastic about getting tough, but then they discovered that they were stopped constantly uh, as potentially undocumented immigrants and began to lose their fervor and enthusiasm for the initiative. And so in addition to the impact on those who wish to migrate or those who wish to hire them or those who are sort of guilty by association and end up with limits on their ability to get around and their sense of mobility and freedom. And the final thing that I want to say about foot voting is that I think it's portrayed in very individualistic terms but for the undocumented immigrants of Partida and Retorno, they really did not see their decisions as individualistic. They saw themselves as part of a network, and they relied very heavily on those networks for survival. So they didn't feel like they could just up and move, for example, in northern San Diego because they were unhappy with the immigration policies. They didn't move to LA that had better immigration policies. If they were really fed up, they went back to the village in Oaxaca. So I think, you know, there's some additional complications there as well. <clears throat> now, we've heard from the political theorists, and now I want to give a little bit of space to immigrant integrationists, because they really have a different outlook. They're concerned about whether immigrants will fully integrate into American life. And politics is part of that package of whether or not you feel that you are included or not. And political scientist Irene Bloomrad ar argues that if you have a sizable proportion of the population that does not participate in the political system, and most notably here immigrants, then the legitimacy of the nation state begins to get affected. It, it's been tarnished by this kind of excluded class. Um, now it's worth noting 
that we've seen very substantial rates of immigration. And so in just a few years ago, one in seven residents of the United States was foreign born. So this is not a trivial population. And for people who worry about full integration, one of the things they look at are rates of naturalization. And those vary widely. So if you look here on Asia, 80% for India. And remember, we have two candidates of Indian descent who are trying to run for president in the Republican Party. So there's a real high level of engagement and integration, I think, in that community. But if you look at Mexico, only 42% naturalized. So that means you have a very substantial population who remain outside of the voting uh, pool. And I wanna add, the real issue is whether you seek naturalization. The rates of success in naturalizing are very high if you try to do it. They're like up, uh, close to 90% and up for different groups. Now, because we know there will be predictably large numbers of people who will not be able to vote some communities have said, we need to do something about that or we're not going to appear to be legitimate. Um, and so in places with high numbers of immigrants, some have created ways for them to vote, particularly permanent residents. The most common is in school board elections. Many of these immigrants have children who go to school. They have a stake in the schools. And the idea is we don't want them to feel disenfranchised in the way their children are educated. But the undocumented pose special challenges because they can't naturalize. They're usually not included in efforts to allow some kind of voting rights for immigrants. And yet, they can be a very substantial population. And so I got these data for Hidalgo Te County, Texas. And about 11% of the population there is undocumented. The issues of legitimacy might not seem as severe if that population is transient, but it's not. It's a long-standing population, and 85% have lived there for over five years, ne nearly 70% for over 10, and only 7% are under the age of 16. So you have a long-standing adult population that can't vote. So these legitimacy issues are substantial. Now, <coughs> even without the right to vote in these elections, immigrants have other ways to exercise their civic voice. Probably the most pessimistic is Susan Kooten, who says that they live in a world of non-existence, a space of non-existence, but others have found that particularly when you have community organizations that promote civic engagement, we, there was a Catholic uh, parish in Los Angeles, for example, that provided services and also engaged people in civic life. This can promote mobilization even by the undocumented. And undocumented youth, are especially likely to be civically active. They are educated in the United States in many instances. They learn all about the promises of democracy, their rights as individuals in a democracy, and in some instances, they're more active than citizen youth. So it isn't as though there aren't any other mechanisms, but still, this lack of access to some kind of electoral voice should be a cause of concern with respect to democratic legitimacy. So I wanted to turn to one final issue here because I think we've seen that the shift in the base for voting could affect minority representation. I think we also probably agree that immigration reform won't change that problem of uh, inability to participate anytime soon. And so I actually wanted to return to the question in the Evanwell case. Can you shift to CVAP? Because the court said you can under equal protection. But I want to argue that maybe you cannot under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And I, I want to say that this argument is limited to Texas. So you remember Missouri authorized this approach. Maybe Missouri can do it. But I think Texas is unique. I don't think it's an accident that the Evanwell case was filed in Texas. And I think that's why it's vulnerable to a Section 2 challenge. Now, Section 2 has two components, voter denial, and voter dilution, and I think it, this would be vulnerable under both. I want to begin by saying, for those of you who think, well, wait a minute, the Voting Rights Act is about, is about people who can vote, <laughs> right? And these are people who can't vote, so how could that be right? My argument is that by excluding the people who are disenfranchised, 
you alter the nature of the districts in ways that might either suppress turnout among those who can vote or dilute the influence of the votes that they cast. So now let's take a look at each of those. Voter denial will typically happen when you use practices that prevent minority voters from casting a ballot. And those have included, and you're probably familiar with this from your constitutional law, literacy tests, um, failure to offer English language assistance, poll taxes, purging of the rolls, removal of voting booths, stringent voter ID requirements, and a number of these have been adopted or have been alleged in Texas. And so I think that why the shift to ZFAP might constitute voter denial relates to the factors that the court uses under its totality of the circumstances test. And it looks at historical discrimination in elections, racial polarization, unusually large electoral districts. This one to me is key. Other evidence of discrimination, a lack of elected minority officials, use of racialized appeals, lack of responsiveness to minorities' policy concerns, and a tenuous reason for adopting the practice. So I want to highlight some of those factors to show why I think you might successfully bring a, a Section 2 challenge. First is historical discrimination. Before Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was eliminated, Texas was covered in full because of past practices of discrimination in the electoral process. It also has the largest number of places that are covered under the language assistance requirements based on prior evidence that uh, voters who could not speak English didn't have equal access to the polls. And so uh, it's also been repeatedly sued over its voting practices and its redistricting decisions um, successfully too um, in some instances. So I think this history of discrimination counts there is also racial polarization in the electorate. If you go out and look how voters of color vote and how non-Hispanic white voters vote, there's a big difference. So you do see that polarization um, and that counts. Also, other forms of discrimination, if you look at the median household income, there are vast disparities between Latinx households and non-Hispanic white households. We also see significant gaps in educational attainment which were worsened by COVID-19. All of those are evidence, and those are factors that affect the likelihood you vote, right? So are you well-educated? Do you have the resources to inform yourself? And so those would also be relevant. The one that I think is really critical, though, is that when you stop counting these people who are not eligible to vote, the districts get very big. And there's evidence that large districts suppress turnout. And so we don't have evidence of using CVAP and seeing a depression in turnout because it hasn't been used. But we do have evidence that when you make the districts bigger, that suppresses turnout. And I think that could be relevant evidence. And finally, the reason for the change. Sue Evanwell said that she wasn't getting enough influence. And I'm not sure if you made the change to bolster the influence of non-Hispanic white voters in Texas, that that would be a compelling reason when there are significant adverse effects on minority voters in Texas. Now I wanted to turn to vote dilution. This happens when people cast ballots, but the impact of the ballots is reduced through either the use of at-large elections where you're a tiny part of the area and so you always get outvoted, or through racial gerrymandering, either that dilutes you again by what they call cracking, putting you dispersed throughout districts so you're always outvoted, or packing. So you're packed, you're crowded into a district and you can't elect as many representatives because you don't have as many districts as you should have. And there's no requirement of proportional representation, but that is a factor that the courts consider. Now, I want to say that I really needed to add this recent Supreme Court decision because before last term, there were scholars speculating that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act was dead. It was a dead letter. And the court really, I think, put the lie to that with Allen versus Milligan because it looked at Alabama and its redistricting and it basically said, Alabama violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act by packing its black voters into one district when they had a percentage that would have merited two districts. Even though we don't use proportionality, this was way off. Now, it's interesting because Alabama def defended itself 
by talking about algorithmic colorblindness. And so the court had used its three-part test. There, was, there were enough blacks to constitute two districts. They voted as a politically cohesive unit, and non-Hispanic whites outvoted them and denied them their preferred candidates. But Alabama said, you know what? First of all, they thought Section 2 was dead, you know, but, but hello, it's live and well, and it's going to invalidate your maps. But also they said, in any event, we used a colorblind process. We fed data that were colorblind into these algorithms. We generated thousands of maps, and they didn't produce two majority-minority districts. They at most produced one, some none. And the court basically said that it was flawed in its fundamentals, they thought that what they called race-neutral criteria were contestable, that the computing was limited to just a few experts, and they had experts say, you know, you could just generate trillions of these maps. So where do you stop to be sure you have the right level? So it's interesting, Texas is currently undergoing redistricting litigation. They too had thought Section 2 was dead. They too have argued that they used a colorblind process, but I think they're gonna have to go back to the drawing board on the defenses now, you might say, but that's racial gerrymandering. This is a shift in the way you count the population. But I remember the Hofeller Memorandum. He wasn't called the Republican Michelangelo of gerrymandering for nothing, because what he was saying is by shifting the way we count, we shift the district lines in ways that advance both partisan interests, it helps Republicans, and it hurts Latinos, now who typically vote Democrat in the state. Now, one of the problems that that reveals is the close connection between partisan gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering. And so when you first read the media coverage, it said it was to help Republicans and to help rural areas. They didn't say it was to hurt Latinos. That wasn't a very nice headline. Um, but Janai Nelson, who's president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, has argued that states can regularly use partisan gerrymandering claims to conceal racial gerrymandering. The court won't touch partisan gerrymandering. It doesn't see that as part of its, its charge. But she says that if you see high levels of race, a partisan impact and high levels of racial and partisan polarization, you ought to apply strict scrutiny to the redistricting. Her proposal may be tested in a case that the Supreme Court is gonna take up this term in which they are going to look at South Carolina's maps, which they justified on partisan grounds, but the claim by the um, uh, South Carolina State Conference of the NAACP is that it was really racial gerrymandering in a thin disguise. So I wanna argue that CVAP is tantamount to a racial gerrymander in a state like Texas. Maybe it's okay in Missouri, but Texas is unique. And there are empirical data to support that. Well, um, it shows this was done by Chen and Stephanopoulos, and they really documented the impact of the shift to CVAP in selected jurisdictions. And they said that Texas was exceptional in the impact. It was exceptional in the partisan impact because the median number of Republican districts goes from 80 to 89, but it was also exceptional in its impact on minority representation with the opportunity districts dropping from 65 to 54. So given those exceptional impacts in both partisan and racial terms, I think that we shouldn't allow CVAP to be an end run around limits on racial gerrymandering in the state when it essentially has the effect of racial gerrymandering. So in conclusion, I wanna say the dramatic growth in immigrant population, I think creates new challenges for de determining what constitutes fair representation. The country has changed since the Voting Rights Act was passed in ways that mean that eligibility for citizenship can significantly act, affect minority representation. And I believe, and you know, I, I hope that if this happens, that my beliefs will be tested, that at least in Texas, which as I said, is so pivotal to the future of, of our democracy, that the federal courts would seriously entertain the idea that Section 2 applies to the shift in the way that you count voters. So I thank you. I look forward to the commentary and the questions.
uh, in my talk, which she prefigured a little bit, I'm going to discuss how we can expand opportunities for Hispanics in the United States to make political choices by a somewhat different path than the one outlined in Professor Moran's talk, and that is by expanding their opportunities to vote with their feet. Uh, as discussed in my work on this issue, including my book, Free to Move, people can vote with their feet in three different ways. Uh, they can do so within a federal system by deciding which state or local government to live in, in part at least, based on the kinds of public policies that exist in those areas. A second mechanism is through international migration. Uh, most of the population of the US is, in fact, descended from people uh, who voted with their feet for the US relative to other countries. And of course, about one seventh of the population, including myself, are people who voted with their feet, uh, even you know, themselves and not just their ancestors. And finally, people can vote with their feet in the private sector, at least in situations when private organizations provide services like education, private planned communities, and the like uh, that are also sometimes traditionally associated with local governments. Uh, and in this talk, I'll first discuss some general advantages that foot voting has over traditional ballot box voting. Then I'll talk about ways in which Hispanics disproportionately benefit from foot voting opportunities. So many of these points are even more applicable to this group than many others. And finally, I'll discuss how we can expand opportunities for Hispanics to vote with their feet, both through international migration uh, and also within the United States. Uh, so first things first, why do we even need to think about foot voting as a mechanism of political choice? Because most of us probably assume that the way we choose the government policies that we want to live under is at the ballot box. We vote for the Democrats or the Republicans or for candidates like Donald Trump or Joe Biden. You know, that's a great, wonderful choice that we're likely to have uh, yet again in the next election. Uh, so why should we look for alternative mechanisms of political choice uh, such as foot voting. The answer is that ballot box voting, although it does have important virtues, it also has two major disadvantages. One is that when you vote at the ballot box, uh, the chance that your vote will actually make a difference, the outcome, is infinitesimally small. In a presidential election, it's about 1 in 60 million. In state or local elections, uh, it's higher than that, but still very low. Uh, it's still usually one chance in hundreds of thousands or one chance in several million or the like. Uh, I would say that in most contexts, if you have only a one in a million chance of making a difference to the outcome, that's not very meaningful freedom of choice. We wouldn't say you have meaningful freedom of religion if you have only a one in one million chance of being able to determine which religion you want to practice or whether you want to practice one at all. You wouldn't say you have meaningful freedom of speech uh, if you have only a one in a million chance of being able to determine what opinions you are allowed to express. And the same point applies to almost any other type of important freedom. And I would suggest it applies to political choice uh, as well. Uh, a similar and related issue is that precisely because uh, most ballot box voters have little or no chance of affecting the outcome, they have very little incentive to acquire relevant information and become well informed about the issues uh, at stake in a given election. They are what economists call rationally ignorant. Uh, they tend to devote only very limited time to seeking out political information because they know the chance that it will make a difference is extremely small. In my previous book, Democracy and Political Ignorance, I talk about this at great length. And if you look at extensive data about what voters know and don't know, uh, it turns out on the whole they know very little. Uh, for example, only about a third to a half of Americans can even name the three branches of the federal government the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. People are ignorant also of basic aspects of government policy, like how the federal government spends its money, what the tax rates are, how various major government programs work, uh, and so forth. Uh, so it is the case that this sort of decision making, for the most part, is very poorly informed. Uh, and that both reduces its legitimacy and reduces the quality uh, of the policy outputs uh, that result. On both of these dimensions, foot voting is significantly superior. 
If you're allowed to vote with your feet, uh, then that's a decision that is highly likely to make a difference to the kinds of government policies that you live under, and therefore it does have this important advantage of uh, decisiveness. And precisely for that reason, when people vote with their feet, they generally speaking make much more of an effort to become well informed about the decisions and uh, the issues at stake, and therefore uh, they're actually also often successful in becoming better informed. If you're like most people, you probably spent more time and effort seeking out information the last time you decided which television set to get or which smartphone than the last time you decided who to vote for for president or for any other political office. That's not because the TV set is more important than who governs the country or deals with more complicated issues. It's because you know that the TV you choose is very likely to be the one that actually ends up in your living room. Whereas when you decide who to vote for for president, the chance that your vote will make a difference is again, one in 60 million to vary somewhat depending on what state you live in. Uh, and so when you flip on the TV and you have the misfortune to see the president or some other politician, the chance that you can affect what that person does and what policies they adopt uh, is extraordinarily small. Um, Professor Moran mentioned the issue of virtual representation. Uh, as noted in my article for this symposium, uh, one additional advantage of foot voting is that it greatly reduces the need for virtual representation because even people who are not eligible to vote at the ballot box, uh, they can still vote with their feet. They don't have to rely on other people to represent their interests. Uh, when those other people may not be interested in doing so, or even if they are interested in doing so, they may not be well informed uh, about what kinds of government policies will actually benefit you. It is true, as she correctly points out in her piece, that uh, children uh, necessarily end up in the realm of virtual representation, and that's true with respect to foot voting as well. However, there is a question out of who do you want to virtually represent your interest if you're a child? Would you prefer your parents who are making foot voting decisions, or would you prefer government bureaucrats or uh, other people in the voting population? On average, I would suggest that children are both more likely to be well represented by their parents because those parents are more likely to understand their needs and more likely to genuinely care about them than either government officials or than unrelated voters in the general population. There are extreme cases where this is not true. Abusive parents, for example, but on average, uh, I think that it is. So uh, another virtue of foot voting is that we reduce greatly the need for any kind of virtual representation. Uh, so I'll turn now to how is it that Hispanics benefit from foot voting, uh, particularly even more so than other groups. One obvious reason why is that Hispanics are disproportionately immigrants. About one third of all Hispanics in the United States are immigrants. Uh, an additional large group are children of immigrants. By contrast, only 14% of the general population are immigrants. And immigrants, of course, are major examples of the benefits of foot voting uh, because if you think about what is the difference between whatever you believe is the best American state versus whatever you think is the worst governed American state, it's quite significant perhaps, but it's small compared to the difference between the US and Cuba, or the US and Venezuela, or the US and virtually any other country from which large numbers of immigrants come. The differences in quality of government here are enormous, uh, and therefore the gain from foot voting uh, is greater. Uh, and that's particularly true when we see from recent Latin American immigration, uh, which comes disproportionately from nations like Cuba and Venezuela, which are horrible communist dictatorships among the most oppressive in the world. Uh, the Venezuelan government, with its horrific policies, has created the worst refugee crisis, or at least the biggest one, in the history of the Western Hemisphere, some seven million people. People leaving Venezuela is pretty clearly an example of foot voting. They don't want to be ruled by this uh, awful, oppressive regime. And of course, there's a similar story to be told about Latin Americans during the United States leaving various types of right-wing dictatorships uh, as well. Uh, and the same thing goes if what they're fleeing maybe is not a particular government policy, but a situation like Haiti where there's endemic violence and poverty, uh, which the government is clearly unable to do uh, very much about. Uh, in addition to benefiting from foot voting through international migration, Hispanics and other immigrants also disproportionately benefit from foot voting within the U.S. because social science research shows 
that on average, immigrants, especially recent immigrants, are more likely to be willing to move to opportunity within the U.S. Uh, than wanting established native-born citizens, so they disproportionately benefit from that uh, as well. Uh, finally, uh, there is reason to think that both historically and today, political minorities, those with minority preferences of various kinds, disproportionately benefit from foot voting. At the ballot box, they often may be outvoted and have relatively little political power, but when they choose between different jurisdictions, that problem is much less severe, and therefore they benefit disproportionately uh, in that way as well. Uh, and this point, of course, applies to Hispanics because not only are they a minority group, obviously, but even within the group, there's enormous diversity in terms of political preferences. There's probably greater diversity among Hispanics than, say, among blacks and some other minorities. If you look at the Hispanic category and you break it down in particular groups, there's obvious significant differences in ideology, voting patterns, and the like between, for instance, Cubans and Venezuelans on the one hand, and on the other hand, Mexicans, Central Americans, and others. Uh, and so that reduces their ability to be a cohesive voting block at the ballot box, but it does not prevent them from voting with their feet uh, if we break down other barriers to uh, foot voting. Finally, it's worth noting that Hispanic foot voting benefits not only the Hispanics themselves, but also the uh, native-born citizens of other groups uh, as well. Uh, Barack Obama once said, in the United States, we have a clear monument to what the Cuban people can build. It's called Miami. Uh, and of course, we have similar monuments to what Mexicans, Venezuelans, and other uh, Hispanics can build as well when freed of the shackles of communism or other kinds of oppressive regimes. These people can be vastly more productive than they would be otherwise, uh, and that benefits all the rest of us as well as the uh, Hispanics themselves. And a similar story can, this can be told about internal foot voting where if people are allowed to move to opportunity, that benefits not only them, but also the nation as a whole because our economy uh, becomes much more productive. Uh, and similarly, immigrants, including Hispanic ones, disproportionately contribute to innovation. They're disproportionately likely to engage in entrepreneurship, which again uh, has major beneficial effects not only on them, but also on the rest of the population. So what can be done to expand these foot voting opportunities, particularly with respect to Hispanics? I'll start first with the issue of international migration. Ideally, what we should do uh, is replace the current system where there is a presumption of exclusion, that is, people can only enter the United States if they're not already U.S. citizens, if the U.S. government gives them special permission, and replace that with a presumption of openness, that is, people can only be kept out uh, if the government can prove that there's some kind of great danger or problem that they pose. Uh, obviously, it's unlikely that this could be fully done in the near future, but there's more incremental measures uh, that could be adopted. For example, uh, we could legalize some or even all of the current undocumented population of approximately 11 million people, about two-thirds of whom are Hispanics. Uh, that would obviously benefit that group and expand their ability to vote with their feet, but it would also benefit the economy. They could be more productive if they could be employed legally and not just in the black market. Uh, sector. Uh, another thing that we can do is we've heard a lot in recent years about the issue of asylum seekers, uh, but there has not been enough discussion of what is the, what is the criteria that you actually have to meet uh, to get asylum. And in order to get it, you have to meet the legal definition of what counts as a refugee, which is very different from the lay person's definition of what a refugee is. Uh, in order to legally be a refugee, you have to show that uh, you have a reasonable likelihood of being targeted for persecution based on race, religion, ethnicity, sex, your political views, or being a member of an identifiable social group. Uh, and many uh, migrants fleeing horrific violence and oppression don't fit this definition. This is particularly true of many Hispanic migrants because many of them are victims of what I in my work call equal opportunity oppression. That is, their governments, like those of Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, uh, most of the people they oppress, they don't target them based on particular membership in one of these groups. 
but simply because they horrifically oppress almost everyone under the government's jurisdiction. And so you can say, well, these people are not victims of a particular type of discrimination, but they're still horribly oppressed. We can expand the definition of refugee to include this kind of equal opportunity oppression that would benefit people fleeing horrific governments in various parts of the world, but it's especially relevant to Hispanic migrants fleeing some of the worst governments uh, in Latin America. Uh, another thing we can do is we can expand uh, the CNDH program, the Cuban, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Haiti program uh, established by the Biden administration at the start of this year. It's modeled on the previous Uniting for Ukraine program, which was established after Russia's expanded invasion of Ukraine last year. It enables uh, American citizens and residents of the United States to sponsor Ukrainians to enter the U.S. Uh, and stay here for two years and have residency and work permit rights. This was later expanded to those four Latin American nations, which have some of the most oppressive governments, or in the case of Haiti, uh, awful violence. Uh, but CNDH, unlike the United for Ukraine, is capped at 30,000 participants per month from all four countries combined. Uh, and I think both Uniting for Ukraine and CNBH have been enormously beneficial. Hundreds of thousands of people have benefited from it already, and the U.S. has benefited as well. But there are improvements that can be made. One obvious one is to drop the 30,000 per month cap. Uh, currently, there's a massive waiting list for CNBH uh, entry. We can clear that up if we drop the cap. Second, uh, the two-year limit should be extended uh, and ideally abolished. In the past, when similar parole power programs have been done, Congress has eventually passed Adjustment Acts, giving permanent residency rights to uh, people admitted under these programs. That should be done here as well. It would be beneficial for members of those groups, but it would also be beneficial for the U.S. economy and society as well. They could be more productive if they know that their time is not going to run out uh, after two years. Uh, so, and also we can expand the program to cover more countries, at least to cover other countries where there's similar uh, oppression and violence as we have in the five that are currently uh, included. There's also much that can be done uh, to expand foot voting opportunities for Hispanics within the United States as well as internationally. Uh, some of that uh, could be done just through measures affecting international migration. As Professor Moran points out in her article, uh, undocumented migrants have more difficulty even moving around within the United States. They have more difficulty finding jobs because they can only work in the black market. Uh, and that could be dealt with by simply granting them legal status or at least giving them work permits, which would uh, eliminate a lot of this problem. The issue of racial profiling, which she mentions and which I've also talked about in my own work, is another thing that could benefit both migrants and merely people who look like they might be migrants, who look like they might be Hispanic or Asian. Uh, it's, not well, it's, it's not well known outside of the community of experts in this area, but the one field in which the U.S. government officially authorizes and sanctions racial profiling is in fact in the field of immigration enforcement. That's true not just under Republican administrations like that of Trump, but even under the Obama administration, which showed the continuous policy uh, for both legal and moral and policy reasons desirable to forbid that racial profiling uh, and change that. And it would benefit, obviously, not just migrants, but also Hispanics who have been born in the United States uh, as well. Uh, the biggest obstacle to internal foot voting in the United States right now is exclusionary zoning, uh, which in many parts of the U.S. makes it almost impossible to build new housing in response to demand and therefore prevents people from moving to opportunity. Uh, this affects poor and lower middle class people of all races, but it disproportionately affects Hispanics because they're on average somewhat poor, and because there's a long history of specifically racially motivated exclusionary zoning, uh, eliminating these restrictions or even easing them would massively benefit many groups, but Hispanics uh, in particular, and I talk about this in more detail uh, in my paper. If we could reduce this, uh, the data shows not only that migrants or would-be migrants would benefit but that the U.S. economy would also benefit enormously overall because more people can move to places uh, where they're more productive. 
There are several other ways in which we can expand internal foot voting opportunities that would also benefit disproportionately benefit Hispanics. One big one is licensing reform. Many states have very restrictive licensing for many different professions, which make it hard for people to move to the state and take them up. Uh, a small but telling example, I'm a sponsor in the Uniting for Ukraine program. Uh, I sponsor two different families. The biggest problem that they have had uh, is that two of the people involved, they're professional hairdressers. They have been hairdressers in Ukraine for, for years on end. They're clearly qualified but it is still incredibly difficult for them to get licenses, in one case in the state of Florida, even though I had high-level connections in Florida state government, which I utilized to try to get her a license, it still has taken many months to do it, and of course, most people, they do not have those kind of high-level connections. It so happens that a former student of mine is the general counsel of the Florida State Government Agency, which controls these licenses. Even so, it was extremely difficult, uh, and of course, most recent immigrants, and of course, and even people moving from one state to another United States, they don't have those sorts of connections. Licensing reform could greatly benefit both potential movers and also uh, consumers of services like hairdressing, who, as a result of these restrictions, get less service and uh, pay higher prices and the like. There is much more that can be done, and uh, I talk about it in my paper, but for now, I'll end on the note that uh, we can disproportionately benefit Hispanics uh, by expanding foot voting opportunities, but it will also benefit other groups and indeed the United States as a whole. Thank you. Great, so thanks uh, to Professor Moran and also Professor Morales and Dean Baines and the Franco family and especially the uh, student editors of the Houston Law Review for How's this that? great invitation uh, to respond to this important and timely uh, lecture okay. by Professor Moran. And I really appreciate that she chose to use this platform um, to draw attention to an issue that has been surprisingly kind of oddly neglected, even though it's already been the Supreme Court once. <laughs> Of, um, of who counts when we draw lines, whether it's all the people or just the citizens or maybe eligible voters. I appreciate uh, Professor Moran's engagement with this issue and also my work on this issue. I'm glad to get the chance to continue this conversation. So I guess just first to kind of situate where I'm coming from, uh, I come to this topic as a student of democratic theory, uh, but also to some extent I think as a parent uh, and also as a Texan. Uh, I grew up in Austin, I taught UT for many years, and I guess I have some appreciation for why this issue has a sharper edge in Texas than um, almost anywhere else. Before I started writing about this issue, I knew that there were parts of Texas, especially the Rio Grande Valley, that have not a lot of voters as compared to their population. And I think I initially kind of assumed that probably had to do mostly with citizenship, uh, but when I started Researching this, I learned that for Hispanic communities in Texas, uh, it's true that citizenship uh, is a factor. Numerically, the larger factor is age. Uh, populations that are younger just have fewer eligible voters, and that is a big part, actually, of why the Texas electorate looks so different from the Texas population. Uh, and that's what caused me to start thinking about and writing about this topic. Uh, and, you know, it's true that politically the conversation about this issue is much more focused on uh, immigration, and, and maybe rightly so, but uh, most of the people in Texas who can't vote can't vote because they're under 18. In Hidalgo County, where McAllen is, it's 30% of the population, uh, of the overall population that's under 18, which is a lot higher than some other parts of the state. And they're overwhelmingly citizens. Uh, even when their parents might not be. So on the substance, I really, I think Professor Moran and I have no significant disagreements. Uh, I take her argument as one that endorses and builds on uh, my own arguments, and Professor Moran, you know, emphasizes some of the downsides of virtual representation. And she's right, and I agree, and I'm in French agree. You know, virtual representation has lots of downsides. Um, and when you compare it to actual representation, that's just true. And that's one reason why I think we need to enable more people 
to actually vote, because uh, that will give us more actual representation. So I thought I would use the first part of my remarks here to spell that out, spell out what that looks like and why it matters. But then just to preview where I'm headed, you know, you're never going to enfranchise everyone. Uh, I have now a four-year-old who has a lot of opinions about many topics, um, and you know, even I don't think that he should have the right to vote. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that means that it sort of follows logically from there that there will be some form of virtual representation. You don't have to like this, you know, but I think it's worth seeing it. Um, seeing that it's happening, because it follows logically from that, that we have choices to make, policy and legal choices about how we set up our system um, so that it does a better job rather than a worse job of the virtual representation that we are stuck with. So that's the second thing I'm going to talk about here. So first, uh, how to get more actual representation. So there's several levers to pull. Uh, one that's been already discussed in a different way is immigration law. You know, the process of naturalization in the U.S., although most people who, almost everyone who applies succeed, it's unbelievably slow and expensive, and helping people become citizens more quickly, uh, I think, is a straightforward policy goal, and we have no shortage of models around the world to draw on because almost every other country in the world has a uh, better version of this than our unbelievably slow and expensive one, which is sort of buying with Japan as uh, the worst. Uh, we also need broader immigration reform that would enable more of the people who are already de facto members of our communities to be de jure members of our communities who could then proceed to naturalize if they wish. Uh, but I'm not going to say more about that. Uh, we also need to end felon disenfranchisement. And I think that's, you know, it's less numerically important, but I think it's an important piece. But I wouldn't frame it as this is something nice that we should do for felons. You know, uh, I'd frame it as getting clear about what voting is. When we disenfranchise people because they committed crimes, uh, we're telling them and we're telling ourselves that voting is a privilege for law-abiding people. Um, kind of like recess in elementary school. Like if you break the social compact, then you lose it. Uh, and I don't think that's the best way to understand what voting is. Voting is a right that helps constitute citizenship itself. It helps give citizenship meaning. Um, and voting is also a duty. It's something that we do to contribute to a public good. The public good is a functioning representative democracy. And sometimes when people commit crimes, we actually require them to go do community service. We tell them they need to use their time and energy in some specific way to contribute to the public good. I think we ought to view felon voting that way. Instead of prohibiting people from contributing to the public good, um, we should frame the duty to vote as part of how we rehabilitate uh, people as citizens. And a positive side effect of this would be more actual rather than virtual representation. OK, I mentioned naturalization. And Felons, the most important lever, though, in terms of numbers, is definitely age, uh, the voting age. And we ought to pull this lever and lower the voting age, uh, as we already did once at the national level in 1971, when we lowered the age to 18, which I think is an important and underappreciated kind of building block of our current uh, modern democracy. The case for going below 18 is strong on a few different grounds, but I think it becomes clearest when you see that it helps promote actual rather than virtual representation in families where the younger generation may be the only ones who are going to be able to vote. So currently there are a uh, small number of localities that allow 16 and 17-year-olds 17, 17 to vote. Um, states have the power to do this for their own elections. I would currently recommend states attempt this with regard to federal elections, that is for Congress and President, because that would invite particular kind of litigation that I think would set bad precedents. But uh, states ought to enfranchise 16 and 17 year olds to vote in state and local elections. And I think there's a strong case for uh, going even younger than that. Personally, I would draw the line at 14, around the start of high school. Any number is completely, you know, uh, to some extent at least, arbitrary. But allowing high school students to vote would create a powerful mechanism to turn high schools 
into sites of civic education and engagement, the way sometimes four-year colleges are now for people who go. Uh, you'd see more campaigning in high schools by local politicians. You'd see them want to appear in front of these audiences of voters. Um, and, you know, the obvious objection, um, it's real, it's that teenagers don't know enough to vote, they don't have enough life experience. Perhaps they'll just do what their parents say, or so the objection runs, which does raise questions for me, like, have you met a teenager? <laughs> but, uh, you know, there is a deeper social science response, I guess, which is to say there are various different ways that we can measure your competence relevant to voting. And I have to say, almost all of them show that it declines with age. Um, and, uh, you know, political cognition is one framework of social science. It, it doesn't get better, my friends. <laughs> it gets worse. So, uh, look, I do take seriously, though, the limited life experience of a 14-year-old. I do think they also have some unusual advantages as voters, the biggest of which is high school itself. Teachers can give people assignments. This doesn't work for adults. Like, research both sides of an issue, or try to write an essay from a point of view that is not your own, you know? Um, I think high school could be, certainly aspirationally has been, the idea is it could be a site of significant civic education. I think this would be more true if people could vote. Okay, what I've just laid out, I think, is something like the maximalist possible case for uh, enfranchising voters. And so suppose that it were politically possible today to adopt all of what I've just said. No felon disenfranchisement, quick naturalization, 14-year-olds can vote, and so on. This still leaves an enormous number of people who can't vote. Um, and so for all of those people, most of whom are still going to just be people who are too young to vote, they're not going to have actual representation who they voted for. They're going to have some form of virtual representation. And so I think it's important to ask the question, what kind are they going to get? Any kind will be imperfect, but uh, depending on the voting rules and how you draw your maps, um, there can be some big differences. Now, mostly in the US, the way we provide representation is through geography-based districts. We draw lines on maps. Um, and this system has come in for a lot of criticism over the years, and for good reason, and clearly there are you know, better and worse ways to do it. Ultimately, I guess, I'm reminded of, of uh, Churchill's famous line about democracy here, because you know geographic districts may be the worst form of virtual representation, except for all the others. <laughs> Professor Moran points out uh, correctly that in any system with virtual representation, voters, particularly some voters more than others, will feel that they have to take into account the interests of their non-voting relatives. For example, Puerto Rican voters in the mainland United States who feel that they have some obligation to vote on behalf of the interests of families who are on the island. And, you know, I think this is true, and I don't think it's really an argument against virtual representation exactly. I think it's um, illustrating the phenomenon. It's showing that virtual representation, in fact, occurs. The hard question in any scheme of virtual representation is how the voters relate to the non-voters with whom we are uh, grouping them in a district or otherwise. And so I think here it's sort of, it's relatively easy to identify edge cases of a very good or very bad relationship between the voters and the non-voters who are being grouped together. Um, I mean, you don't want first, you don't want the two groups to be very distant. Um, that was the situation before the American Revolution where the British told the US colonists that they were virtually represented in the British Parliament, even though they couldn't elect anyone to the British Parliament, which I think is a problem Alexander Hamilton captured pretty well with the line, why should a tiny island across the sea regulate the price of tea? Actually, that was Lynn and Paul Moran. <laughs> you know, kind of nails the basic problem. On the other hand, you don't want the voters and the non-voters to be close, but, um, in an antagonistic relationship to one another. So you don't want a district in which you have a large population of farm workers, none of whom are eligible to vote, and then landowners, all of whom are citizens, and they vote. This is not going to go well. I mean, there may be moments of interest convergence, but in general, this is not going to go well. And I think that the example that Professor Moran described uh, of the Oaxacan immigrants to San Diego is sort of much less extreme than my stylized hypothetical just there, but, you know, that's the objection. It's the same objection. 
Um, on the whole, it seems that geography-based representation manages to do better than this. And I think a major reason for that is that we have a lot of communities in which people are living in families and households and often you know, extended families where people live still in a similar area that include both voters and non-voters in the same families, often in the same households. And often because of that, you can get some degree of alignment of interests and also political views, and especially political scientists like to measure partisanship within, um, within families and within households. Now, there are exceptions to this. You know, there are issues that make this uh, form of virtual representation more straight. And one, you know, maybe classic is, uh, is climate change, which has the unusual property that it seems to have a particularly intense age skew within families. And, you know, it depends how you ask the question and how you measure, but I think overall there's certainly something there. Telling young people, you know, don't worry, you can't vote right now, you'll be able to in, you know, a few years, and in the meantime you'll be represented by the people who your parents and their friends elect. This doesn't work as well if the young people in question view as the central political issue something where they're disagreeing with their parents and um, the rest of the voters uh, because they think climate change is more of an emergency. And I think young people in that situation are perhaps um, the best argument for lowering the voting age. Uh, and also, I would say, it's not surprising that absent the lowering of the voting age, like undocumented young people, you know, this is an area where you see people reaching for forms of political participation that are not voting um, because they, they see that they need to. So it might seem that law is um, too distant or maybe too blunt an instrument to really try to improve the quality of virtual representation. Um, but I don't think that's true. I think Professor Rand is right that the choice to use CVAP rather than total population is an example of a choice that is subject to Section 2 analysis. Um, and that it's possible in Texas that switching to CVAP would illegally dilute uh, Hispanic voting power. But even short of the switch to CVAP, when drawing lines, it is possible for law to consider what kinds of, dis uh, what kinds of representation a district provides to the people who live in the district, even if not all of them vote. And I, it makes me think of, uh, in 2006, the Texas redistricting case of Lulac v. Perry, uh, in which Justice Kennedy struck down a gerrymandered district that stretched kind of from the valley all the way up to South Austin. Um, and Republicans had drawn this district deliberately to have a Hispanic majority. Basically, they were trying to make up for deleting a different district that also um, had formerly had a Hispanic majority. Justice Kennedy said, though, that the new district didn't count as compact for Voting Rights Act purposes not primarily because it's sort of noodly looking, you know, shape, but because the wildly disparate populations that it was grouping together, who really were all at the north and south ends of the district, were uh, just too different. They didn't have much in common, these populations, other than being Hispanic. And so I think in this analysis, you can see the germ of what a Voting Rights Act jurisprudence could look like that uh, would look at who is being grouped together into a district. I would ask how much this community of people has in common. Does this community have a candidate of their choice? Uh, and if so, we might want to know to what extent is this community actually able to elect someone of their choice who would reflect not only the voters, but also the children and other non-voters uh, in the community. When we draw district lines, we make choices about which people to group together, we decide whether it's going to be a district composed of groups with antagonistic interests, where one group can vote and the other can't, in which case the group that can't, you know, they're not going to get any actual representation, they're also not going to get very good virtual representation. Or we can choose to group together sets of people who are more similar in their interests and views along whatever axes are the central political axes of the day. A lot of districts in the Rio Grande Valley uh, do not have a lot of voters. They have a lot of eligible voters who don't vote. They also have a lot of people who are ineligible to vote, primarily because of age, secondarily because of citizenship. The even one plaintiff said, you know, well, the fair thing is just to basically give fewer representatives to the ballot. 
because we want equal numbers of voters everywhere. There are all kinds of things wrong with this, and I've written various critiques of this argument elsewhere. But I guess the heart of the matter is that whether people vote or not, whether they're eligible or not, they make the same kinds of demands on government. And they make them primarily, not individually, but in groups. It's true that any one individual's chance of uh, deciding an election is extremely small. But voting is fundamentally not a selfish act. Selfish motivations don't successfully explain why we vote. Um, in fact, I think this is why Professor Zoman has uh, perhaps some trouble explaining why do people vote. We vote, I think, uh, for a few reasons, partly because it's a duty, also because it's something that we want to do together with others to elect people who represent our communities and groups that we're part of. And if we want that to happen in Texas, we need to draw districts that are based on total population. And we also need to draw district lines such that the non-voters are adequately represented by virtue of the voters with whom we group them. Uh, so, in my comments today, I focused on how to get more actual representation and then how to get better virtual representation. And I guess the last thing I'll add is that these strategies are complementary to each other. They're not sort of substitutes for one another. They work together. So, for example, we need the concept of virtual representation even to understand part of what the benefit was of lowering the voting age to 18 and what it could be from lowering it further. And a big part of that benefit is to give mixed status families some eligible voters. Um, and it's true that those voters will have the burden, uh, but they'll also have the opportunity of being people in a position to make sure that their families actually do get some actual representation. So, uh, in summary, virtual representation, you know, it's not anyone's first choice, but since there's going to be a lot of it, especially in places like the Rio Grande Valley, uh, especially in actually many parts of Texas, um, we should at least try to do it well. Thank you. Are they working? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, wow. Um, thank you all for just a tremendous conversation. I think this is um, just a wonderful um, testament, I think, to the power of, like, yes and. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, this is the kind of scholarly conversation that I got into academia here. So, so kudos to you all. Um, I think. This is a sort of, perhaps not comprehensive, but extremely robust um, discussion of the place of the Latina people in um, U.S. Uh, political life. Um, so, so I have lots of questions. I think the audience has lots of questions. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose two questions to Professor Moran, and then one each to Professor Summit and Fishkin. Okay. So, for Professor Moran, I mean, I think I want to talk about elephants. Um, there are some elephants that are, I think, lurking here in the room with us. Um, and I think there's at least two, there's a lot more probably. Um, but the first one I want to talk about is um, sort of the radicalization of one of our political parties around the precept that sort of we the people doesn't mean all of the people. Um, you know, I think in that context, right, the shift to apportionment based on voter eligibility rather than persons appears to me to be just simply one more strategy in a broader effort um, to lock in political formations and arrangements and the dominance of the past. Um, and so, you know, the court has aided in this process. And I think you're certainly right to point us to some moments of holding back that the court is showing in section two. But I do want to just ask, you know, isn't the focus, given sort of the way in which the right to vote is really under-theorized constitutionally, isn't this shift to voting population actually kind of like a really convenient way to do the work 
that Section 2 prohibits, given the over oh, the sort of the overall ideological um, bent of the party as a whole, and Chief Justice Roberts um, against the, you know, I mean, he's got to be put in the Section 2 exists for now, um, but it's only there because preclearance is gone. So anyway, um, so I guess my question, to put it more precisely to you, is what is it that makes you hopeful or not, um, or but why in particular do you think the court is going to hold the line here? And I think it's important work that you just articulated, and I hope they take up your argument. Um, but I'd like for the audience to know sort of why you think this is a line that either the Roberts Court will hold or ought to hold um, in more detail. Well, I think one thing that I thought was important was that you know, this Allen versus Milligan decision, which recognized the Voting Rights Act violation when people thought that the act was, that section was moribund, coincided with the affirmative action case, which said that racial categories are not coherent for purposes yeah. of university admissions. But blackness was legible in Alabama. Was that and that part of that related to the empirical evidence on the patterns of voting. I remember the court said we don't have any metrics for why these categories matter in admissions. So one thing I feel is that the court was signaling there that race can still matter. So I think that's one reason to be optimistic. I also think it's very interesting that the court just took this case out of South Carolina. Now, we'll learn a lot from that case about just how far the court is willing to go. But the willingness to engage with what has been a long-standing concern that partisan redistricting is used to camouflage racial gerrymandering. I think that's important, and, and I don't know how the court will come out, but I think it's important to get some greater clarity on that. Um, because it's been used as a shield so often to say, oh, we, don't, we didn't choose this because it's going to suppress minority voters. No, we did it because it advances our party's interests. Um, so I think we'll learn a lot from this pending decision. But I think the fact that the court took it means that they didn't treat Allen um, versus Milligan as a one-off. They're willing to engage with these issues more. Wonderful, thanks. So my second off right, is the way in which state action, both here in Texas, but nationally, um, it works in ways to sort of de-legitimize um, Latina membership, um, both social and political, in American public life. And I'm speaking specifically, and I think all the commentators can potentially talk about this, maybe Professor Summer in particular, but I'm thinking particularly of the way policies like asylum restriction, the building of the wall, which, you know, these are all bipartisan projects, so I want to be really clear, right? Um, the recent legislative demonization of Latino people, um, you know, trying to target undocumented people in Texas for deportation and sort of in clear violation of Arizona and the United States. And so I'm wondering, I mean, just maybe thinking from below, like thinking of like political demands, to me that package of policies and state action really works against the realization that you're looking for of um, kind of full participation rights in the political world for Latinx people. And so um, I just want to know how you think of that tension and maybe where the um, kind of pivot points are that you see where we might uh, either through Latinx organizing itself, you know, California is an example of a flip back and forth, for example. Do you see that happening in Texas? Like sort of an awakening not from numbers, but an awakening from attack, right? Um, and sort of an awakening that happens, and a mobilization that happens in Arizona, of course, is another example of this. Um, or do you see, um, or do you really think that sort of this is gonna be a from the top phenomenon um, where Latino people are really uh, recognized as full members, um, sort of despite a lot of the messages that the state is sending, state and federal governments are sending. Well, I will say this, the contestation over full inclusion has been going on a long time. I just did a piece on Plywood versus Doe, which came out of Texas, and, and Texas had said, you know, undocumented children can be barred from our public schools or charge tuition, which 
or many of them because they didn't have the wealth to pay for, for tuition. And one of the arguments that was made is that these students couldn't be residents of the district because they weren't persons within the jurisdiction because they were there illegally. And so one of the really critical pivots is who counts as a person and then how is person connected to these issues of citizenship and immigration status more broadly. Um, and that has been going on a long time and Texas has always been at the forefront of, and there, if you look at like the cases that are being brought, Texas is suing over federalism, right? They want sovereignty to decide these issues. There was a really interesting feature of another case involving the DACA and the, the, the court said maybe we should give standing to Texas to challenge all of this because of the federal government's abdication of its responsibility to patrol the border. And so they said Texas has to step in. This is relevant to the new bill, right? The claim is we have to fill in because the federal government has abdicated its responsibility. Um, the court didn't choose that. There were other ways to establish standing that were more traditional. But you can see here not only a debate over who belongs, but who gets to decide on these issues. And it's, Texas has really been a leader. Now, I want to say more generally, not just with respect to immigration, that as demography is altered, there will be other tactics. I think the recent efforts to preempt urban areas in Texas from being able to set their own policies um, is another example. And it didn't involve immigration per se. It involved things like protections for laborers, water breaks during the gather incredible heat domes that <laughs> developed over the summer, but that's a way to take democratically dominated areas of the state and deprive them of the ability to innovate in policy matters by creating a state uniformity, which is going to be dominated by Republicans. So it's almost like moving from single member to at large, and it's like local to state. Um, and that has pernicious consequences as well. So some of this is partisan. Some of it also is racial, but the efforts to preserve power in a changing so once you finish, polity, I go to watch out of the uh, you know, we're seeing those also at a national level with debates about how the election should be conducted and so on. But I do, I do think that it's going to be important. To, I think Texas is going to be the place with the playbook for preserving power in a changing demography. I really do. I, I see so many different examples of it in the voting, in how you know you usurp power from the local to the state level, and the efforts to challenge federal authority. That 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 all of those taken together are elements of this dynamic, and that's why I think it's so interesting to be here because a lot of the earlier civil rights cases also came out of Texas on bilingual education, on school finance. You know, they used to call it the golden age of Texas liberalism, right? But the leadership was coming out of Texas on a lot of issues. And Texas was the first state to allow in-state tuition for undocumented. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting place because it had seeds of really, you know, transformative inclusion at the same time of powerful exclusion. Wonderful. No, thank you for that. Um, okay, so now I'm, I'm going to pose a question to Professor Soman. Uh, Professor Soman, you know, uh, there's a lot of foot voters in the room. Texas is the most foot voting. These state people are voting with their feet for Texas. So, yay, Texas, right? Um, so they're voting with their feet for Texas, but I think, you know, I, I love your idea of foot voting mainly because I feel like it's a supplement to other forms of representation. I think the other virtue of thinking about foot voting is that it focuses us on the material rather than the ethereal, right? I mean, I think, you know, human beings have material needs, and I think foot voting um, is, is often driven by those material needs over others, and I think your focus on zoning and its wealth build, and, or its anti-wealth building potential because people can't fund housing, um, and, and other sort of material aspects that I think predominate in the move into the decision-making process of like where we move, um, are important additions to the conversation, I think especially in law, because I think we tend to focus on the formal, um, where I think that's a divergence from sort of reality, right? Where most people, I think you're right, do focus on these pocketbook issues when they think about where to move. 
I think the question I have for you builds on Professor Moran's um, last, second to last point about subs what I'm going to term subsidiarity, which is this tension because U.S. states, many of them, especially Texas, California, are so large. Um, and I do think that the largeness of these states tends to dampen the possibilities for finding a space that for most Americans fits all their preferences. I'll just take my selfish example. I like that I have a big house here and I had an apartment in Chicago, you know? That's wonderful. I don't like, for example, that, you know, the state has taken over my child's public school um, and I have no ability to control the superintendent. Um, and so, you know, I'd love for you to build and say more about either the constitutional, and here I'm thinking of Rand Herschel's work, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. He was at UT, he went back to Canada. Um, he, ran, he, he voted with his feet to Texas and then said, I don't like it, and went back. Um, but, but, but Rand Herschel really thinks that there's, there needs to be more constitutional standing for localism, and I think our current constitutional formation really prohibits that because all of these localities are simply viewed constitutionally as creatures of the state. So I'd really love to hear more about that from you, if you don't mind. Sure. So it is certainly a legitimate question to say, well, it's hard to vote with your feet when you're dealing with a big state like Texas or California, because you have to go further and perhaps break more social ties and job connections to do it. Uh, in some of my work, including in my book, Free to Move, uh, I offer several ways to approach that. One sort of simple and obvious way, though hard to implement constitutionally, is simply to break up big states into smaller pieces. That was actually tried in California recently, where eventually there was a, there was a referendum question to put on, to make a state constitutional amendment to do this uh, for technical reasons. They didn't get on the California ballot. I think that's sort of a simple solution. I don't want to annoy all the Texans, uh, but if Texas were three or four states rather than one big one, foot voting would be easier and some other problems would be easier as well. People could still have a common Texas identity, just as there is a Southern identity which exists across many states or a New England identity. I grew up in New England, but uh, with, with breaking up larger jurisdictions, uh, some of this problem would be reduced. A second way to reduce it, and I was also talking about in my work, is you can devolve more to local governments, and that can be done just with state constitutional changes. States vary a lot in terms of how much authority localities have compared to states. Uh, a third way is to have more issues be decided in the private sector, where you can vote with your feet in the private sector, often without physically moving. You mentioned the issue of schools and school boards. Uh, there is another bill before the Texas State Legislature right now, which would fix that problem really well by having <laughs> universal school choice. This is this part of the Republican Party's agenda is arguably in tension with other parts of their agendas where they want more centralized control of various aspects of curriculum and the like. Uh, but I think this part is the good part of their agenda, whereas the, the other one uh, is, is bad. Uh, and so if you have universal school choice, as several states have already enacted, and hopefully more will do so, that will enable more people to vote with their feet without physically moving at all. It will reduce centralization a lot because each school uh, with perhaps minor restrictions could set their own curricula and so on. And we can do similar things with a wide range of other uh, public services. I've discussed this uh, in, my, uh, in some of my work. Uh, so uh, ultimately, the solution to insufficient decentralization that comes from larger states in most cases, just more decentralization to localities or to the private sector, some combination of both. This can't work for every single issue out there, but it can work for a wide range of issues, including most of the kinds of issues that typically are handled by state and local governments. Uh, and we can thereby empower people to vote, more people to vote with their feet and reduce associated moving costs. But even in the status quo with the 50 states, people for whom policy differences are a big deal, they still have a decent number of options uh, and they could have more if there was less exclusion or rezoning and less of some of the other kinds of problems uh, that I talked about. You know, I, I'm not going to get on the voucher bus personally. I have, we, we can have a longer off, off the table discussion about that, but... Um, I will hope see the light. Oh, well, I, I doubt that, but... Um, <laughs> I think others might see the light. Um, 
in any case, uh, lastly, um, Professor Fishkin, um, I think I think what's um, really powerful about your work is that you have sort of highlighted the sort of inevitability of virtual representation and the way it's just under-discussed, under-theorized um, more broadly um, when we talk about voting rights. And I think it's sort of inevitability and necessity is a really sort of salutary um, intervention in our discussion. Um, I think, you know, one, uh, I was talking to um, Professor Moran b before her talk, um, and one thing I sort of noticed reading her paper was that sort of the biggest probably divergence, right, is the, um, in, in virtual representation in Texas is between, um, is between white children and Hispanic children, right, in terms of how much virtual representation they enjoy, right, because by virtue of um, the fact that so many more white children have parents who are voting eligible. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering what you think are the prospects for the recognition of virtual representation. And, um, and in particular here, I'm thinking like, would you like to see legislative action to sort of foment more equality on virtual representation? So like an amended Voting Rights Act that sort of recognizes this um, theorizes it properly and recognizes an equality interest in virtual representation. Do you think that the court is the place where that needs to happen, um, either in their own interpretive jurisprudence about the Voting Rights Act? So here I'm thinking like a recognition of this sort of children's, in particular, rights to um, equal vote, you know, virtual representation um, by their parents, uh, or at least you know, in districting contexts um, to some degree. Um, so, so I'd like to hear more about that and I, I hope you can share with us, thanks. Sure, uh, well, yeah, the remarkable thing about your question um, is that I find myself in the strange position of mostly defending what we have because the odd thing about what we have and the thing that I think should be appreciated more than it is, is that you know, I mean, congressional districts are very big, you know, they, that's, that's sort of too many people to really do this analysis with. But, what, but when you think about like a state house district and you look at some of the districts, I'll just stick with the valley because that was my main example throughout the talk. Um, you know, there are far fewer voters in some of those districts than there are in like the wealthier parts of suburban Houston and Dallas. But the children are actually having about the same amount of virtual representation. There's not the gap that you would think there would be. Uh, now maybe there is in a vote for governor or something like that. And you know, we certainly have an interesting problem statewide with the fact that if you have everybody vote, um, these, these places in Texas that have far fewer voters are going to be swamped and they're going to have their votes outweighed. Uh, and that's why the statewide electorate in Texas looks one way, and the um, the delegations of people who we elect when we get to do districts, like to the state house and senate, look different, especially the state house. Um, so mostly, I find myself defending this aspect of where we are. Um, but as the project that your first question to Professor Moran was bringing up, this sort of like innovations in minority rule that, uh, you know, sort of rolling in various Midwestern states and in a different and more racially focused way in Texas. Uh, that project clearly is uh, going to turn to various methods and this CVAP thing is one method of changing the ground rules to make them more favorable to the older, whiter, more Republican parts of the state having more political power. Um, and, you know, Texas isn't that close yet to the tipping point. I feel like throughout my growing up here, it was like, I mean, I mean, first of all, Ann Richards was governor. It did, this whole thing wasn't so obvious. But, uh, but over time, I feel like Democrats in Texas have been always been like, oh, yes, you know, we're about 10 to 20 years from demographic <laughs> change swamping. And it's sort of like, well, okay. But if you're like that for 50 years, then you're not really... Um, and the, reason, the, the reasons are many, uh, some of them have to do with the topics that we've been talking about um, today. Uh, but I guess my concern is that if we don't sort of uh, 
see and articulate what this current imperfect, messy system is providing, um, which is it's providing a lot of political power to populations of people who don't vote very much. Uh, that's an unusual thing that we're doing that a lot of people who do uh, have the majority in the Texas state government um, might prefer wasn't happening as much. And so I think we need to sort of be conscious of that and uh, try to think about how to preserve it, some of which could be, uh, could be in litigation, but um, uh, I feel like it's, you know, it's for, for all the reasons that, um, that Professor Marion already put on the table, it's, it's tricky to know just how much uh, this Supreme Court would be helpful to that defensive project. Um, so partly, I think it may be a matter of using the, uh, the political power that, um, that there is now for uh, Hispanic Latino communities in Texas uh, to use what they can to veto mm. state law changes that would make this uh, situation worse. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Fishkin. Um, so now I think we're going to turn um, question Q&A over to the audience. Um, I'm told that someone will be coming around with a mic that is located over there. So if you could please raise your hands if you have a question. We'll also be taking questions from an online audience, um, which I believe um, you should put your question in the chat and it will be selected um, as uh, we have availability. Over there, I think this... Um, man has his uh, hand up, please. Okay, um, thank you. I actually have a question for all three of our speakers, both our keynote and the two commentators. And I'm also a major at the public policy school, and one of the topics that came up there is basically that no matter which system you go with, actual voter turnout is pretty low. So I just wanted to ask for each of your proposed solutions. I mean, you don't have to answer both, but first, um, what role do you think overall voter turnout has on the effectiveness of your proposed solution? And second, what effect do you think your solution could have on increasing or reducing voter turnout? Um, Professor Moran, do you want to start us off? Or? Well, why don't we let, I think that's sort of your okay. house because I'm informed and whether it's worth it. And sure. So uh, I would say a couple things. One is when people vote with their feet, if they see an opportunity to do so and it's worth it, uh, turnout is not much of a problem. They have strong incentives to uh, you know, seek out the opportunities and to act on them if they're there. In terms of turnout in ballot box voting elections, it is not obvious to me that a higher turnout is necessarily better because I talked about voter ignorance before, as bad as it is among the people who do turn out, those who don't turn out, on average, they know less. That isn't true in every single case, but it is true on average that that is, tr that that is the case. Now, there are certain scenarios where nonetheless, uh, it could be the people who know less will make as good or better decisions than people who know more. I talk about this in chapter uh, two of my book, Democracy and Political Ignorance. There are unusual scenarios where like actually having more knowledge is worse or at least not better. But on average, uh, in most cases, it is in fact better to know more about the issues that you're voting on, especially if uh, knowing more just means you know very basic facts that the people who know less don't know. So I think there's this difficult trade-off with ballot box voting between, on the one hand, getting a representative electorate, and on the other hand, exacerbating the problem of voter ignorance. That problem is one of several that is mitigated by empowering more people to make more of their decisions through voting with their feet. Uh, I would note also this is an area where I have relatively few disagreements with what Professor Moran said. I do have more disagreements with what things that Professor Fishkin said, and that I worry that some of his proposals would lead to a lower quality of electoral decision making. For instance, uh, people under the age of 18 on average do in fact have much lower levels of political knowledge than those over the age of 18. I have in my work proposed maybe we could allow anybody of any age to vote so long as they could show in a knowledge test that they know as much as the average adult voter does. Uh, but obviously there can be difficulties with implementing that proposal when we might not trust the government to come up with a good test and stick to it. 
Um, Professor Biskin, do you want sure. to respond? So, <laughs> sure. Well, I'm happy to. I don't need to go back to, to, to voting and age, but I have a, a few things to, to respond to from the, from the original question, too. So um, most of the reason that there are so many fewer voters in the places that have the fewest voters is actually turnout among the voters who are eligible. I mean, this isn't true everywhere, but it's true in quite a few parts of the state. And I think part of what my argument uh, here is really about is just that uh, our system of geographic districting preserves political power for communities that have low turnout. Um, now, obviously that only works if the people who are turning out are more similar to everybody else who isn't turning out, you know, which is sometimes truer than other times. Uh, and that's part of what I think we need to take into account when drawing lines. But uh, I do think that, um, that there have been periods in American history where you might need a lot of knowledge to understand how the different political parties related to each other and how your views related to the two of them. And this is not one of those periods. We are in a time of enormous polarization, which has a lot of negative consequences and problems, but one of the positive side effects is that it's clearer than usual which way to vote uh, for many people. And why people still don't vote has a lot to do with disaffection with politics itself. And I think there's a, uh, a lot of room for thinking about how at the community level, not the individual level, to think about how we should uh, show people through local government um, and elections, even to state government, but from small local areas, not voting for president, that, um, that voting, and I'm not gonna use ballot box voting with apologies, it's just voting, uh, you know, uh, can actually, not for individuals, but for communities, can actually uh, get you benefits. I think people for, um, for as long as there's been politics have, have recognized this is, the, this is the, the feedback loop you need. And it's been cut sometimes, in part state preemption has not helped, but you know, uh, we need this feedback loop of a community gets together and it votes for a government and then the government does something that they wanted them to do. Uh, and then you see that that worked. That's a loop that it's <laughs> tricky to maintain and there's a lot of veto points in the American system and there's a lot of ways that that loop gets disrupted, but I think making that role is the ultimate way to um, improve people's interest in participating. Um, Professor Moran. I will just say that I think there are a lot of reasons why turnout is low. Some of it may be disaffection, some of it may be kind of a rational neglect. But another reason is that, and it came up in my talk a little bit, and it came up in your account of people wanting to do something collectively, right? That it's not just an individual act. There is such a poor infrastructure for mobilizing voters. We've seen here in the state efforts to make it more difficult to register, to show up, to, you know, where's the booth? Where's, what kind of ID do I have to have? But on top of that is the failure of the parties to actually mobilize Latinx voters. The, there has been a perception that Latinx don't vote, which has become a self-fulfilling prophecy because you don't see these kinds of collective mobilizations. Um, and what we saw from that Catholic parish is that when you become part of a collective and you are an engaged member of the community, even when you can't vote, you can find ways to participate. So one question is how can we mobilize civic engagement, not just at election time, so that you have a stake in the issues, you're informed about the issues, and you believe that your engagement counts in some way. And we just haven't been good about that. Um, and it's unfortunate. I, and I'm not quite sure right now which party will eventually do the better job. There was an actual political consultant who did a study, and they said, you know, that so polarized, we know how people vote before they show up, except for one group, Latinx, the last wild card in American politics, mm -hmm. because they don't appear to be as polarized. 
Also, they are pocketbook voters. We've got lots of data on that. And they are receptive to both parties if they will address the needs. And that's why there's been recent articles about Republican inroads into what was traditionally a Democratic constituency, also a fair number of independents. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know when that will happen. Um, there's been efforts by the Republican Party. George Bush was very effective in garnering the, the Latino vote. He got the highest, I think, percentage. Re Republicans typically get about 30%. He got about 40%. So, but the model of reaching out and doing better in the Republican Party was actually destroyed by the polarization around immigration and race. So they had had a plan, but it fell apart because the base seemed so oppositional to it. So I'm really going to be curious to see when and if that kind of infrastructure of mobilization develops because it confers political advantage. Because right now we're so equally balanced. There's this book called The Bitter End that in any given election, either side can win. And the impulse has not been to say, let me get better at mobilizing so I can win. The, the answer has been, we, it was rigged. It wasn't fair. Something went bad, you know. It wasn't a fair election. And so when we move away from process-based claims that we lost because there was some cheating going on to actually substance-based responses that involve including voters and addressing their needs, that, that will be an important moment in American democracy, but I don't know when and if it's going to happen. Okay, um, other questions from the audience or from um, our online folks? Uh, I see a hand up over here. So I have a question for Professor Soman. So I completely understand how voting with your feet is going to be better at affecting change for the individual as long as you're able to do it. It's a lot quicker of a way and you can see the effect of your actions. Um, now, looking at that on the broader scale of actually affecting change in a political system or the location that you go to, I don't see how that is immune to the major criticism you had of standard voting being that, you know, if your individual vote is very unlikely to matter. So when it comes to voting with your feet, especially because, you know, looking at the actual population that can vote versus the total population, I think voting in an election would actually have a greater effect on the, the large scale than voting with your feet. So how does voting with your feet enact more change on a political scale? Can let me answer in, in two ways. One is it, the individual part is still important because at least the individual or the family, they can immediately or very quickly change the policies they have to live under. And that's a big difference. Uh, also, there are important and beneficial aggregate changes when there's opportunities for many millions of people to vote with their feet as there have been sometimes historically and can be more today if you adopt some of the kinds of reforms I talked about. You can have those individual changes multiplied over many millions of people uh, and that has an enormous effect. In addition, it has incentive effects on governments that if they know that if they have flawed policies, they will lose some of their tax base and the like, that it incentivizes them to adopt better policies and the incentives there are better than when you have voting at the ballot box where that is heavily influenced by ignorance and other similar problems. And so the quality of policies you get enacted as a result of this uh, will be somewhat better. But even if there are no changes in policy anywhere as a result, if many more people people end up living in relatively better jurisdictions as opposed to relatively worse one. That is also a huge transformational thing. And then finally, I mentioned before, a society with more foot voting opportunities, both international and domestic, is a much wealthier and more productive society. And having that extra wealth and productivity enables us to address a wide range of problems more effectively than we could otherwise. Uh, it's probably not surprising, but there's lots and lots of data piles of it would show that societies that have more wealth, 
more income, uh, are better at dealing with a vast range of problems, and also, by the way, tend to have somewhat less uh, racial, ethnic, and other kinds of conflict because those kinds of conflict are worse when people perceive a zero-sum game. Like when there's, you know, it seems like there's relatively little economic growth, and employment opportunities, like people are, have more of a tendency to think, well, the only way my group can gain is at the expense of another group. So uh, while the mechanism here is individual or in some cases family-based, there's also massively beneficial aggregate effects, which on the whole often are better than those of ballot box voting because less influenced by uh, problems of ignorance and bias and other uh, similar dynamics. Okay, other questions from the audience? Uh, pro <laughs> Dean, <laughs> prof uh, that. Dean Baines, yes, please. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists. I thought it was a fabulous conversation, and a conversation so useful for Texas. And so, really, welcome to Texas, Professor Moran, especially. <laughs> Your voice is very much needed. Oh, in another state. foot vote. <laughs> <laughs> But um, my question is to Professor Fishkin, specifically about re uh, lowering the voting age, right? Because my recollection is that there was a constitutional amendment to lower it to 18. A lot of it was because of the protests of the Vietnam War, and people, I think the, my recollection is that the tagline was like, you can go, to your, go fight for your country and die if your country should be able to vote, is, I, I'm, or something like that. And so, what, so from, from a political standpoint, how do you expect it to, for that to be lowered to 14. And then in terms of pop, popular discourse, you have our presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy who wants to raise it, I think, to 25. Uh, so, which I also pro I think is probably untenable, but I'd like your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, yeah, for the question. Look, I think you're right about the, uh, the major political impetus for lowering the voting age from, for those of you who don't know, it was usually 21 in most places before a combination of a Supreme Court decision and a quick constitutional amendment uh, led to a uniform national rule of 18. And, you know, we have a tendency to set these arbitrary ages at places where they align with other ages for other things, and 18 is the age of majority for almost everything. And so I think there's a natural reason to have it sit at 18. 21 was sort of like, we think you need to be an especially mature citizen to drink and vote but not die for your country overseas. <laughs> that was a little bit untenable in the end. I think, um, you know, you're right to point to Ramaswamy's unconstitutional and bizarre proposal <laughs> as a kind of interesting example of the way that as we move toward a, um, you know, a deeply polarized politics in which a slightly shrinking minority, but still a very big minority of kind of white Republicans wants to c sort of maintain uh, majority control of more jurisdictions, proposals like that start to make sense. You have age polarization of the electorate to a, to a limited degree. I mean, I really, I think it's easy to exaggerate how many younger voters are, um, are Democratic compared to older voters, but there's, there's some age polarization. And I think that's part of what Ramaswamy's proposal is about. He sees that this would be a way, he knows it won't be enacted, but you know, he sees that this would be a way to kind of signal who he thinks are the real voters and the good voters. And I think that in practical reality, what you're likely to see for in terms of lowering the voting age is states that allow their localities uh, to lower their voting age even for local elections are, you know, currently Maryland is a big one and a bunch of localities there have done this. It's because the politics of the state are exactly the mirror image of Ramaswamy's politics. Um, so I don't expect the Texas state legislature to be at the forefront of lowering the voting age. I think that's obviously the opposite of where things are currently headed. But I think that in the long run, uh, if some jurisdictions that see either as a matter of um, just kind of recognizing the existing political engagement of their young people, who particularly in issues like climate um, and also uh, immigration have been uh, very politically active and visible. Some communities that are in, 
you know, more progressive jurisdictions might say, okay, we can look at being like these towns in Maryland. We can look at uh, enfranchising younger people. I think this is an area that if it ever comes to Texas, this policy change will come here late, not early. But uh, I think that it's a useful conversation to have because it's, it's really a question of, um, you know, balancing a few different goals. Do we see voting primarily as sort of individual cognition and let's have tests to see who's, you know, the most capable of doing it? I have to say, if that was how we really did it, and there have been many proposals uh, throughout our history for, uh, for doing things like that, you don't get a lot of poor people voting. You don't get a lot of the people who have the least education voting. And I think part of what has made American democracy uh, successful is that we have been able to have political movements that don't only come from the more educated and more elite parts of society. So I think this is a change that um, if it comes here, it will take a long time, but it's worth waiting for. All right, thank you. Other questions from the audience or from the online folks? Over. Oh, okay, over here. The mic is making its way. Uh, this is uh, just an idea that I had uh, based on Professor uh, Solman's uh, talking about foot voting. Um, and also for uh, Professor Modan, um, you know, people can move around and and, and um, they can uh, they can increase the representation with with foot voting. But couldn't they also just stay put and have and have bigger families and have a lot of kids and um, you know, maybe it's just a matter of time. But if a parent can't vote and wants virtual representation through their kids or their kids' virtual representation through their parents, then couldn't communities also just have bigger families and over time, you know, if you enact CVAP, um, considering the totality of the circumstances, maybe if it's an analyzed in a, like as a snapshot of time, it might dilute votes. But, you know, if you have a big family and people grow up and they stay in the community, then um, wouldn't that... Um, wouldn't that kind of negate the, the dilution of votes over time, especially if well, we just talked about lowering the voting age, which, yeah, I do. <laughs> but, um, but even if, you know, for a time they stay put, go to 18, then maybe that would change the analysis. So it's an interesting idea. I think there are many good reasons to try to increase the fertility rate. We could probably have a whole different uh, event on, on that, but I'm not convinced this solves the problem that I focused on, which is like, let's say, you know, you, uh, you, you, you a given family is okay, we're going to greatly increase our voting power and have like 10 kids and when they grow up, you know, instead of having only two votes in our family, we're going to have 12 or however many it is. Still, even with the 12 votes, the chance that your 12 votes can influence an electoral <laughs> outcome is still going to be extremely low. You could say it's not just the one family, it's the entire town or the entire city or whatnot that will increase its fertility. That will give the city perhaps more impact on statewide elections and the like but it will take many years before the effects occur, whereas with foot voting, you're gonna have effects much faster. And even if you do have the bigger city with more voters, still you have problems of voter ignorance and bias, which I would add exist as much or even more so in periods of great polarization as in periods when there isn't as much polarization because it still can be a, a problem figuring out, well, what are the better policies, even when the policies are very different? Uh, and secondly, uh, the voter ignorance affects not just you know, people's choices between the final two candidates in a general election, it affects what kinds of platforms and candidates the party is elect put forward in the first place, because when they know they're facing a generally ignorant electorate, uh, they have very different incentives than if they're facing one that's relatively knowledgeable, not to mention that the outcomes of primaries can themselves be influenced by ignorance. I think uh, Donald Trump 
very effectively uh, exploited ignorance about various issues in the 2016 GOP primary, but that's an extreme case of a much broader uh, phenomenon. Uh, so I'm all in favor of having higher fertility rates, other things equal. I'm not convinced they would solve this particular uh, set of problems. And, and just to add, uh I agree with you that there are some intergenerational dynamics that are really important because when we look at the youthful Latinx population, they are overwhelmingly citizens because of birthright citizenship. And every month they're aging in, even with our current age of 18, into becoming eligible voters. So one critically important thing is how are they being socialized politically to be engaged in the process um, how are these, you know, this remarkable new cohort of voters going to get involved or not? And I also want to say that for me at least, a big open question is in recent years the amount of immigration had declined, for example, from Mexico. And now we're seeing a lot, of, uh, an upsurge in undocumented immigration from Latin America. And I don't know how that will affect the sense of political efficacy, the perceptions of the population, the extent to which, you know, even if you're a citizen, you get demonized as being undocumented or somehow facilitating undocumented. And, and so, you know, some of those are barriers to participation. And some of them are actually linked to climate change, which has greatly disrupted the economy in Central America. There have been internal studies to figure out what the impact on migration to the United States is going to be as a result. So I think there's some unanswered variables there. We know these kids are aging in at 18, by and large, because they're citizens, but we don't know the impact if we see an uptick in undocumented immigration on the sense of political efficacy, visibility, and voice of those, those young people as they age in to the political process. And, and for me, those are really important dynamics to consider. So thank you for the question. Yeah, the context of reception is really important to how people feel integrated. And that, that actually accounts for sort of the, some of the differentials within the Hispanic population, mm -hmm. right? Like Cubans were sort of loved as anti-communists yeah. at the time, and so Cubans love America, right? I mean, and so Mexicans demonized, they don't love yeah being citizens as much, right? And the Puerto Ricans are Yes, citizens. and we're, co yeah. we're colonized, so. <laughs> you, but you are citizens. But we are citizens, right. as long as you right. on the island, you don't have full voting rights, right? right? So it, it's, my father <laughs> got out of Vietnam, because you know, you could be drafted and you couldn't yeah. vote as yeah. Puerto Rican, yeah. so yeah. He, he joined the Air Force to not die, basically. Right. Um, <laughs> in any case, lots of stories like that from Puerto Rican uh, men. Um, other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, sir. It's a very male-dominated Q and A. I just want to point out. Well, this person's anonymous. <laughs> this person's anonymous. Um, oh, okay. All right. Uh, they're there interested in uh, whether the <laughs> from online. They'd like to know if there are any reading materials that the panelists would recommend they read. Um, some reading materials, that, that's a great question. So books you would recommend to people who want to learn more about, uh, I, I think I know what Professor Summon's gonna recommend, but, but it's a good book. <laughs> so obviously I'm an academic and academics who write books engage in shameless self-promotion. Uh, so I, I can't claim to be an objective commentator on this, but I do in fact have an entire book on foot voting called Free to Move, Foot Voting, Migration and Political Freedom. Uh, revised edition came out just last year from Oxford University Press where I go into these issues in much more detail and on top of that, 50% of all royalties raised by this book go to causes benefiting refugees. Uh, so there's also this altruistic reason potentially to, uh, to look at it. So I, I, you know, I, I do cover the issues in a lot more detail. There's obviously a lot of other uh, literature including excellent works by many writers about various types of democracy uh, and foot voting. One that occurs to me is sort of an older book that's relevant to some of the issues on the panel is Hannah Pitkin's book, The Concept of Representation, which is a 1967 book, but she really does a great job of laying out different theories of representation, including virtual representation and how they work or perhaps don't work. Vote with your wallets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And in terms of Latino politics, I do have a few. I did mention the book 
by Abigail Andrews on undocumented politics, but Michael Rodriguez Muniz has a, a book called Figures of the Future, Latino Civil Rights and the Politics of Demographic Change, which I think is a really interesting account of the constant claim that numbers alone are gonna push Latinx into this position of national prominence and how they coped after all those decades of making that claim with Donald Trump's election. That it's a very, very well done book and he was embedded in all of these political organizations. I also wanna mention um, there's a book by Benjamin Francis Fallon called The Rise of the Latino Vote, A History. And it really talks about how Latinos mobilize to gain more national recognition as a political constituency. And also there's another one, and I'm blanking the author's name, but it's called The Hispanic Republican. Mm -hmm. And if you're really interested in figuring out how we ended up with, you know, the Repub you know, kind of Republican presence and how people mobilized and where that came from, he carefully recounts the history and it's kind of an untold story. So I think those are, are several books that you might be interested in. I'll, there's also a lot of great articles as well um, out there, but those are fairly recent and I think pretty comprehensive and careful, balanced accounts. Yeah, I'm gonna check that one out to understand my uncles. Um, sure. Go ahead. Oh wait, we, I think Professor Fish can just oh, it's okay. to give his book. I don't have a lot to add, no, and I'm not gonna promote any of my own books. Uh, but, I, but I think there's, I think there's uh, because, they're, because they're less directly relevant than some. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of great work already mentioned, and I'll, I'll second uh, a mention that earlier a book by uh, Lynn Vavrek and some co-authors, The Bitter End. Uh, I think that's really an excellent sort of portrait of our current political stalemate and how it is shaping uh, a lot of things about American politics. If you're interested in Texas redistricting in particular, a book that I um, that I wouldn't recommend to any audience except maybe this one, because hopefully if you're if you're here at this talk, you're you're interested in this book. It's it's uh, there's a book from a while ago called Lines in the Sand by Steve Bickerstaff that is a inside account of uh, a bunch of rounds of of Texas redistricting, and and I think will give you a good kind of background in how we got to the current racial and partisan uh, alignments in the state that we have. And by the way, the author of the Hispanic Republican is Gerardo Cadava, so. Who writes for the New Yorker, I think. What? He writes for the New Yorker as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, let's uh, give the panelists and our keynote speaker a round of Professor Moran, and we welcome her to, to the state of Texas. I know she's going to have, you can see she's going to have a major impact on the conversation, the dialogue, the politics, and the legal analysis now that she's in our state. So let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> and many thanks to our commentators, uh, Professor Ilya Soman from uh, George, uh, George uh, Mason Law School, and Joe Fishkin from UCLA Law School, and of course our own moderator, Daniel Morales uh, from UH Law Center. <laughs> and many thanks to the Frankel family for all the years they've supported this scintillating conversation. Uh, we really appreciate that. Many thanks to the Houston Law Review and all their members <laughs> and editorial staff who will be working on these, on these articles. And we really want, we, we realize how impactful this conversation is and it's really important for us as an academic institution to not be afraid of hard issues, not to discuss hard issues that affect each of us and all of us. And this is what the Frank Lecture does every year to discuss these kinds of things. And what we try to do in all of our programming is to really have a vibrant conversation where we look at both sides of the issue and that we look at and we make sure that we provide light, not heat, on an issue. So again, thank you so much for coming. I think there's lunch. I know you may be hungry. I believe there's lunch in the next room. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
Follow us on Instagram at emphasisaddedpod or check out the law review at houstonlawreview.org.